So now we have decision time. We're going to need to decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. So as we've said, a small p-value suggests that such a large value of the test statistic is unlikely to occur under the null hypothesis. Okay, so a small p-value gives us evidence against H0, but is it enough evidence? Well, usually we need to have a binary decision. We need to either reject the null hypothesis or else fail to reject the null hypothesis. I should mention, we never accept the null hypothesis because we're testing the null hypothesis. We either reject it or we don't. Um, but the, the right vocabulary isn't to, reject, to accept the null. It's just to fail to reject the null. So, okay, our p-value is small. That gives us some evidence against H0. Should we reject the null or should we not reject it? Um, well, if it's really small, we want to reject the null hypothesis, and that would correspond to making a quote-unquote discovery where we've discovered something new and interesting about the world, hopefully. Um, but how small is small enough? So, like, should we only reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is below 0. 0.0001, or is it enough to reject the null hypothesis provided that the p-value is below 0. 0.01? So oftentimes 5% or 0 0.05 is used as a cutoff for rejecting a null hypothesis, but that's kind of just an arbitrary number that uh, people use. And I always tell my students that the reality is that how small that cutoff should be depends on how bad it is to make a mistake here. And in particular, a what's called a type 1 error, which uh, I think Danielle is going right. to introduce soon. And I'll, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but that cutoff of 0.05 is very field-specific, um, and it's like by no means a gold standard in any way. So, okay, the, the thing we need to be thinking about when we're doing hypothesis testing is this table. So this is like the table of truth. So we have rows and we have columns in this two-by-two two table, and the columns tell us what reality is. So the leftmost column corresponds to the truth being H0. So the null hypothesis really holds, and then the rightmost column is under the alternative, HA, which is the alternative holds, so the null does not hold. And then there's two possible decisions we can make. Those are shown in the rows. Either we reject the null hypothesis or we do not reject the null hypothesis. And of course, in reality, we never know which column we're in. We know which row we're in, but not which column we're in. Exactly, because the, the rows correspond to a decision that we're making. It's my choice whether or not I reject the null hypothesis, but I, I have no insight into, or I don't no know. No certainty. No certainty about which column I'm in. So there's sort of four scenarios that we can be in here. So the first scenario here, this corresponds to the null hypothesis holding, and I decide not to reject H0. And this is great. This is a good place to be because it means that there was nothing interesting going on, and I didn't reject the null hypothesis. Nothing to see here. Let's move right along. This is good. In my uh, courtroom example, this sort of corresponds to the defendant being innocent and they, they're not convicted. That would be good. Okay, so this is another thing we can be happy about. Um, here, the null hypothesis does not hold, and we rejected the null hypothesis. So here, Gareth, how's your defendant doing? Well, guilty and convicted, so we're happy about that as well. Well, probably. Maybe not. Some people might not be. I guess it depends on like what, whether, what the crime was and that type of thing, but we don't need to get into that probably. Okay, so now here, this is what's called a type 2 error. And here, the alternative hypothesis holds and we decided not to reject the null hypothesis. So this is known as a type 2 error. And in this situation, the... Well, actually, Gareth, you tell us what happened to your defendant. Well, guilty, but uh, he got off for, for it. So th this is a situation... Or she. Or she. Or they. They. Okay. Uh, it could be, for example, that uh, the defendant... Uh, was guilty, there was evidence of guilt, but not overwhelming evidence. And of course, on a jury, we're, we're instructed that we should not uh, convict someone unless we sort of have evidence beyond reasonable doubt. And a hypothesis test setup is similar to that. We may have suggestive evidence, we may have a test statistic that's relatively large or a p-value that's relatively small, but not small enough to actually be sure enough to reject the null hypothesis. Exactly. All right, and then finally, the fourth scenario. Here, the null hypothesis holds, but we rejected the null hypothesis. And this is known as a type 1 error. And type 1 errors are what we try to avoid when we're doing hypothesis testing. We, or to put it a better way, it's not that we try to avoid them, we try to control them. And saying that we try to control them, that's a statistical way of saying we want to make sure we're not making too many type 1 errors. So uh, what's a type 1 error in your courtroom example, Gareth? Well, this is the worst one, right? This is the uh, innocent person uh, 
Uh, she's innocent, but convicted of the crime. So in this example, finally, we have someone who's innocent and convicted of the crime, and that's the woman in this example. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. <laughs> so so the, the type one errors and type two errors are both mistakes. We want to ideally avoid both of them. Why, why is it the type one error that you chose to say this is what we really want to avoid? This really has to do with the asymmetry between the null hypothesis and the alternative. Like the null hypothesis is codifying like our default state of belief about the world. And there's gotta be like a lot of evidence for us to change that default state of belief. So if we rejected the null hypothesis, we're saying like, wow, there was just like a ton of evidence that's causing us to change our minds about how the world works, change our entire understanding of the world. There must have been a lot of evidence and we don't want to draw conclusions like that willy nilly. And that's why type one errors, we really need to be careful about. It's sort of like if um, the, the, the rejecting H naught is like the headline in the newspaper that's like vitamin C cures cancer. That's like you've rejected H naught. H naught is that vitamin C does not cure cancer. If the headline is a vitamin C cures cancer, somebody rejected H naught, and we really, really, really want to make sure that they are right. We do not want that to be a type one error. Right. So in, in medical studies, we are most worried about a type one error because it suggests that some treatment or drug or whatever it is that we're looking at is somehow has a beneficial effect that in reality it, it doesn't. And obviously that can have a, a large yeah. impact. But then a type two error, uh, is, is also a, a, an issue here. In practice, we would like to have both small type one and type two errors, but the reality is that to minimize one error, you actually tend to make the other one larger. So there's always, always some sort of trade-off between the type one and type two errors. And the sort of the standard setup is that we believe the type one error is worse than a type two error. So it's not that we ignore the type two error, we still want it to be relatively small, but we concentrate more on the type one error. Yeah, and just to wrap that thought up, if, if you're familiar with the idea of power, which we're not gonna get into today, the power of a, of a hypothesis testing procedure, um, the power is one minus the type two error. So that's how, how well, power- Well, the probability of a type two error. Yeah, one minus the probability of a type two error, thanks. Great, okay, so the type one error rate is the probability of making a type one error. And what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna want the type one error rate to be small. And it turns out that there's a really easy way to do this. If we only ever reject H naught when the P value is less than alpha, then the type one error rate will be at most alpha. So if you feel in your heart that you want your type one error rate to be no more than 0.05, then you should just reject the null hypothesis whenever the P value is less than 0.05 and so on. Um, or if you want your um, type one error rate to be 0.01 or 0.01, then you should reject the null hypothesis whenever the p-value is below 0.01 or 0.001. Or the physicists will sometimes choose much, much smaller uh, p-values here uh, because they like to be very, very certain about what they're doing. <laughs> well, the way that I would think about that as well is like, think about like what your sample size is. If you're like running some kind of a study and your sample size is like 20 or 30 or 40, it'll kind of be hard to accrue enough evidence against H naught to get a fantastically small p-value. But by contrast, if you are like Google and your sample size is like every click on like the google.com homepage in like the last four days, you have a fantastically large sample size. Or similarly, if you're a physicist and you're studying like subatomic particles or whatever, you might have a really, really big sample size and then you can afford to use an alpha that's like 10 to the negative six or something. Well, that raises a, a, another issue here that if your sample size is large enough, it is actually relatively easy to end up with a very small p-value but only a very small difference, say, in the means between the control and treatment mice. Let's say we found uh, a million mice lying around somewhere, we perform these hypothesis, this hypothesis test, we're very likely to get a very small p-value, but that doesn't by itself. Assuming that the alternative holds, assuming that the null hypothesis well, doesn't hold. But, but the reality is that the null hypothesis almost never exactly holds. So if there's a very, very small difference between the control and treatment mice, if I have a large enough sample size, I'm almost certain to get a small p-value, even if there's a very, very small difference. So sometimes people equate a small p-value with telling us that there's a large effect going on. And the reality is that if you have a large sample size, it might only be a very small difference. Right. Uh, you're just sure there is a difference, but we don't actually know how big that difference is. Yeah, that's is. absolutely true. And this is sort of the difference between statistical significance and practical significance. So often 
if the p-value is below, let's say, 0.05 or 0.01 or 0.001 or whatever threshold someone's using, they'll say that it's statistically significant. Well, that doesn't mean that it's practically significant or scientifically important. Gareth, just before we leave the slide, I want to hear more about this scenario where you found a million mice lying around. We, we just started remodeling our guest house. So. <laughs> All right. Los Angeles, I guess, must be a thing. <laughs>